Tonight Deacon Brian and I are going to do a three-course meal and uh, and we're going to also uh, make some drinks. So uh, we're going to start with the dessert and the dessert is going to be a uh, cream de menthe cake. And this is a very easy recipe that I learned from, there was a benefit dinner in Kansas City back in the 90s and a friend of mine went to that dinner and they, at each place they had all the, the whole menu and the recipes. So he brought that home to me and uh, I, the, the only thing that really interested me was this dessert and I thought, oh, I can do that. It is uh, a white cake mix, very difficult. <laughs> and so this, what I have in the bowl here is just the, the, the cake mix dumped in there. And then uh, follow the recipe on the box for the cake mix. This one uh, asks for three egg whites, a half a cup of vegetable oil, and a cup of water. But what we're going to do here for this recipe is we're going to subtract three tablespoons of that water. And we're going to replace that with three tablespoons of cream de menthe. Which is going to give it a nice minty green color and a nice flavor. Now normally you would mix this with a hand mixer or a stand mixer, either one. But just for the benefit of the camera, I'm going to do it by hand because it, it's, it's quieter. So we just dump in all these liquids. And mix it. I think this uh, box suggests mixing it uh, on medium speed for two minutes or by hand for five minutes. So I'm going to do it for 30 seconds and then turn it over to Deacon Brian. <laughs> and actually I'm not because we can do this later. I, I have one already baked because I want to show you what we're going to do after that. So this is what it looks like after it's baked. You can just see that even uh, though it's mostly brown, you can just see a slight green tint to it. And then we're going to frost it with two jars of chocolate sauce. And this is hot fudge sauce, whatever you can find in the store is just great. So as you know, mint and chocolate go well together. And the recipe really calls for one jar, but why do one when you could do two? Exactly. The final step is we're going to take a tub of Cool Whip, but we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to do three tablespoons of creme de menthe. It's a really bright green. Yes, but of course once, once you uh, Fold that in, it's going to be a lot lighter. Yeah. And when it gets that pale green, it makes you think more of mint. And you don't have to get it completely combined because a little striping just looks good anyway. So we're just going to pour that on there. And then just gently move it around because you don't want to get any of the chocolate coming up through it. And there it is. Dessert is ready. We'll cut it later and we'll garnish it with a little mint.
So being a Catholic cooking show, we have to do some drinking. And I'm gonna make a martini. Martini drinkers are very persnickety and they like it the way they like it. And I'm not gonna try to convince anyone to do it my way. Uh, but th this is just the way I do it. First of all, I like gin. I, I hate vodka. If you would rather do this with vodka, it's the same recipe. Uh, and, you know, if you like vodka, you're free to be wrong. It's not a problem. <laughs> so, uh, I'm just going to do a full measurement of the gin. And, uh, And you want to use dry vermouth with this, which is the white vermouth. You would use a sweet vermouth or a red vermouth for a Manhattan, but this is the martini and it uses dry. And so, uh, you know, different people like it different. The original recipe was two to one, two parts gin to one part vermouth. I like it a little drier than that. Uh, a dry martini simply means less and less vermouth and a totally dry martini is just straight gin. Uh, why do that? You know, <laughs> uh, the vermouth adds a little something. There's a reason it's in there. And then the next important part of this, and I think this is very important, we're going to put ice in there. We're going to fill that with ice and then shake it. And James Bond always says, shaken, not stirred, and there's a reason for that. Gin tastes best cold. The colder you get, the better it tastes. And you can stir for half an hour, and you're never gonna get it as cold as you can get it in 30 seconds with a shaker. And you can see how frosty it's getting, and you shake it until your fingers can't take it anymore. <laughs> it gets that cold. I like to keep my glasses in the freezer so that you don't warm up the drink with a warm glass. And then you want to strain that because after all that shaking, you've got a bunch of little ice crystals in there and they'll float on the top and just ruin the experience. You want a pure martini up. If you look closely, you can see how much ice was preserved there. Okay, one last thing. Martinis are traditionally served with olives, and I like that. But in the summer particularly, I think it's just much more refreshing to do a twist of lemon. And so I just shave a, a nice thin slice of lemon and drop it in there and you're done. Not bad. So I'm going to make an old fashioned, which is one of my favorite drinks. Now, usually old fashions are going to be made with bourbon. You can use any type of bourbon that you like. I have Knob Creek here. Whatever your favorite is, go ahead and use it. But I'm going to switch things up tonight and actually use a rye whiskey instead of a bourbon whiskey. So I've talked to multiple bartenders over the years. I've asked them how they like to make their old fashions. They all give me a completely different recipe or not completely different, but uh, with some differences. But they all claim that theirs is the correct way to make it. So I'm just going to teach you a way to make it. First, we're going to start with simple syrup. Now you can find this at the grocery store like this or it's really easy to make at home yourself. Just combine one cup of water with one cup of sugar, boil it in a saucepan. Once all the sugar's dissolved, let it cool and you're good to go. And so we're just going to need about two of these teaspoons and it's not exact, good enough. 
And then next we need just a few dashes of bitters. So just two or three, that should be good. It doesn't take a whole lot. And then we get to the good stuff. We'll add the rye. So most recipes I see call for about one and a half, one and a half ounces. Um, I don't know exactly how much this is, but it's close enough. Again, nothing here is exact. And then we'll mix that up. And then I have another glass here with a big ice cube in it. Whatever ice you have on hand is good. If you just have regular ice cubes, if you have the ice uh, spheres, we have a special mold that can make these big cubes. And so we're just going to pour that onto the ice. And then last but not least is the garnish. So first we're gonna garnish it with some orange peel. So I have a vegetable peeler here. I'm just gonna peel off a strip, twist and squeeze that a bit and put it in there. The orange peel isn't going to do a lot as far as flavor goes, but it's the aroma. When you're drinking it and that peel is right by your nose, you get that citrusy scent and it really combines with the flavor a lot and it does a lot. And then last but not least, we're going to add a cherry. Um, what I have here are these uh, bourbon cherries. They're from the Woodford Reserve Distillery. They're cherries that have been soaked in bourbon. Uh, you likely don't have these on hand, so just regular maraschino cherries will work as well. So then just one of those cherries. And cheers. It's good. Our first course is a pasta. And uh, this is a recipe, after so many years you kind of forget, but I think I first saw this in a, an ad for pasta. Sometimes in an ad in a cooking magazine they'll have a, a, a recipe. And I liked what I saw and, and I've made it ever since and I've kind of made it my own. I think the original recipe called for bow tie pasta, farfalle in Italian. Uh, but I like it better with fusilli, which is what we would call corkscrew pasta. I just think it soaks up the broth really nicely. That's one of the changes I made. So I have garlic and olive oil and red pepper flakes. Red pepper flakes in Italian cooking, they add a little heat, but mostly they add depth. Sometimes you don't really know what it is in there that's giving it such a unique taste and quite often it's the red pepper flakes. They use them a lot. Okay, you just want to cook that till it gets kind of fragrant and it's getting there. You don't want to burn e either the gar garlic or the red pepper. And then I'm just going to take chicken broth and dump it right in there. About a half a cup. And I'm going to add a little, uh, that is low sodium chicken broth, so I'm going to up the sodium a bit. And some black pepper. And when that comes to a boil, actually I don't even have to wait that long, we're going to dump a bunch of stuff in there. So the first thing is tomatoes, and these have been seeded, quartered and seeded. And that's one of the reasons for adding salt. Tomatoes always need salt. This is uh, asparagus, and I've just cut it in about a one inch dice. And this is just whole basil leaves. I think the recipe calls for, you know, six or seven large leaves, it says. These are pretty small leaves, so I'm adding quite a few. Okay, we're just gonna let that cook down. While it's doing that, those tomatoes are gonna soften 
the asparagus will get done and the broth will thicken and reduce just slightly. But you want to understand that this is not a sauce in the traditional way we think of uh, pasta sauces. It's more of a broth. And, uh, and so when you get finished eating the pasta, there's always broth left in the bottom of your bowl and it tastes so good you don't know what to do with it. Well, you sop it up with good, thick, hearty bread. And in Italy, that's considered polite to sop up sauce with bread. It's a compliment to the chef. It's, it's saying to them, it's so good I want every drop So we're ready to plate this pasta. Fusilli expands considerably. And so I may have made too much here, but. We'll see. We have our sauce here and you can see that while we were waiting for the water to boil and everything, it has cooked down considerably. And, uh, and that tom tomato just sort of, uh, you can kind of even smash it around, it blends in and becomes part of the broth. So we're going to take a large spoon and just put that right over the pasta. But you want to make sure you get some of that broth because that is the, the gold. And the final touch is a little Parmesan cheese over the top of everything. And one final grind or two of pepper. And we're ready to eat. And this time Brian did set the table. Yes, so I did. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us, O Lord, in these thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. Of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless the chef. Okay. And we always want to remember those who are hungry in the world. It's a fairly complex dish. Um, you have the flavors of the asparagus, which is a kind of a grassy flavor um, that's very, I don't know, springy, summery to me. The tomato is uh, citrusy and rich. The cheese uh, brings it all together. But that broth is, uh, you know, chicken broth, when you put a bunch of other things in it, uh, it picks up a lot of flavor. Say, so you, you did it again, Father. <laughs> this is excellent. For the main course, we're going to have lemon chicken. And this is a recipe that I think I made up, but you know, you kind of don't know after so many years. And we're starting with a little bit of uh, grapeseed oil and butter. And of course, 
The reason you put the oil in is because butter burns real quickly and, and smokes and all that sort of thing and this diffuses that so that the butter can get nice and brown without getting that burnt taste. So I have two chicken breasts here that I have salt and peppered it. We're just going to put those in season side down, get a nice sear on them and while that's happening we'll season the other side like that. I use a cast iron skillet. I've done it with various pans, but nothing does it as nicely as cast iron. It, uh, it gets that intense heat so that you get a nice brown on the fillets. And that, of course, creates flavor. some water in the butter that's popping and that makes a nice little mess you have to clean up but it's worth it and you know sometimes I put a screen on there but then you have to clean the screen I think it's just as easy to clean the stove and the counter okay we're gonna it's hot enough now I think we're just gonna lay those in there you get that nice sound So we'll season the other side. And then you have to be patient because you want to turn those things and you, but you really need to let it get brown. And you can kind of tell when it's getting there when you begin to see some white coming up the sides of, of those chicken breasts. If you don't see that, you know that it's nowhere near ready. And I zested and juiced one lemon. So after we get this turned over and let the other side cook a little bit, then we're gonna pour this in there and let it evaporate and that's going to give us a really intense lemony flavor and it's going to turn brown which is good because then your sauce is going to end up being brown nothing worse than an anemic sauce okay you can see how that white is coming up the side there a little bit yep, still needs a little bit more so we're going to try this again now we've got some nice brown in there and that's what you want. So we're going to let that second side cook a little bit. Not nearly as long as the first side, but, you know, a minute or so. And that should be good enough. And so we're going to take that lemon juice and zest and just pour it in there. And then you want to take some dry white wine and about the same amount as you had lemon juice. And after that lemon juice has almost completely evaporated, you're going to pour the wine in. And I like to pick that up and make sure I get some of that lemon juice on the bottom side of that breast. You see how that's turning quite brown. Now we're going to pour the wine in. And once that gets boiling strongly, then we're going to lower the temperature and cover it. <clears throat> so it's going to kind of steam the rest of the way. And while that's happening, we're going to make the vegetable. And the stock is totally edible, but it helps to cut off. There's a kind of a tough skin over it. But the inside is very tender and flavorful. So 
then you can just cut that into slices and then the florets start coming off. So for the two of us that ought to be plenty. I'm gonna, those stems are a little tougher and take longer so I'm gonna cook them a little bit before I put the florets in. And you want to add a little salt to the water. And cover that. Emeril Lagasse used to say in his shows, I don't know about the water in your place, but my water comes unseasoned. I have to season it. Now, chicken breast is not very flavorful and it tends to be dry uh, so it's hard to get uh, something that's really tasty and tender and juicy but I've discovered that one of the secrets is you really have to have the temperature within about a 5 to 10 degree range and so uh, Chicken has to be 165 degrees in order to be safe to eat. So between 165 and 170, it's just tender and juicy. It's really great. But if you get much, if you get up to 175, it's chewy and dry. So I start fairly early checking the temperature. This is an instant read thermometer, and you just keep checking until you get it where you want it. So that's about 130 right now. The other one is, is only about 115, so we've got a ways to go. And I've got some more wine here ready because quite often that liquid will burn off and, and uh, you need to add more to get the steam going again. Just added the florets so it all should come down about the same time. Okay, you can see we're getting a little dry there. Not dangerously, but, but I like to turn them over because then you get that wonderful color on the bottom side. And I serve them like that because they look great. Now, it's starting to sizzle around the edges, so I'm going to add a little wine. I don't always know why they don't get done at the same time. I think it's my stove of that burner, but uh, at any rate, they come due separately. And then we let them rest on a plate there. What the chefs always say about any kind of meat is you let it rest, and that helps the moisture to come back in, and it's juicier and more tender that way. We are there. Now we have this lemony, winey concoction there, and I'm just going to add a pinch more salt and a couple of grinds of pepper. Stir it around a bit. Again, there isn't going to be a whole lot of flavor in the chicken even now, but when you pour this sauce over it, it makes it worth every minute that you spent on this. And what we're doing now is we're just reducing it, making it less liquidy and more intense. And the, the, the more intense you get it, uh, the richer the flavor. And if you, if you go too far and it gets too, 
too dry, you can always add more wine. If you get too much wine, you reduce it down again, but you want something that looks about like that. And let's see how our broccoli is doing. That looks ready. So we're gonna drain that off. And then we want to put it back on that. The burner is off, but there's a lot of residual heat there. Because we want any drops of water to kind of burn off. So it got that pretty dry. And then we're going to add a few turns of pepper. And some butter. Doesn't really take much butter. That's about a half a pat, you might say. And then we're just going to toss that. until the butter melts. Now there are all kinds of ways of doing vegetables like broccoli, but most of those ways are for people who don't like vegetables. In other words, you're covering it with some other taste. Uh, I like vegetables, and I think just a little bit of butter and salt and pepper just brings it out all it needs. My mother always uh, did broccoli in a cheese sauce, and oh, it was divine. But why all those calories when this tastes great too? <laughs> Okay. And then some of that juice from those breasts just pour in. We don't want to waste that. And you can tell as soon as you cut into it with a table knife. If it just goes right through, you know that it's juicy. It is good. This is very good. So you can see the layers there, the chocolate in the middle. This is a great summer dessert because it's, uh, the, the mint just feels cool any time of year, but it also is, uh, you know, you can put that in the refrigerator and it keeps the Cool Whip nice. And then when you eat that cold, it's really refreshing. Garnish it with a little mint and we're ready to eat. Another success. <laughs> the mint is so subtle. Uh, it's not overpowering. Yeah.